ready? Well, I guess we'll jump right in. <laughs> Let's start with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning, this beautiful morning, uh, which we prayed for, and you uh, answered our prayers, and we are grateful for that. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to learn more about your word and how to, how to read it, and we just pray that you would be uh, present here with us this morning, uh, guiding our thoughts and our words and our learning, that all we do might be to your honor and glory, in Jesus' name. All right, well today... We're going to talk a little bit about translation. We, we talked last week, um, a little introductory stuff, and we, we introduced the idea of exegesis, which is getting uh, to an understanding of what whatever verse or passage we're studying actually meant originally, when it was originally written. And then hermeneutics is the process of then taking that information and trying to figure out uh, what it might mean for us today. Um, today, today, not 1700 today. <laughs> um, and so, one of the first places we start is with a translation. And uh, I don't know which translations you brought, but there are all sorts of different translations available today. Um, and if you think about it, we have our, our Bible has. 66 books in it, um, but there, none of them were written originally in English. So most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, although a couple of passages, uh, half of uh, the book of Daniel, and two passages, passages in Ezra were written in Aramaic, uh, and then the New Testament was written in Greek. Uh, so how many of you are fluent in <laughs> Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek. It's not what I'm standing up for. <clears throat> so that's, that's the issue. Uh, they were originally written in other languages which none of us speak. Uh, and so just by choosing an English translation, we are choosing some particular translator or group of translators' uh, work uh, and trusting that they have done a decent job of translating it into our English. So we'll look at some of the issues of translation and, and how to pick a good one. Um, if you only have one translation, whatever it is, then you were pretty much at the mercy of the people who translated it uh, to, in order to figure out what the Bible says. Um, and I have an example here for you. <coughs> now, keep in mind, these are all the same verse of Scripture. From the New King James Version, it says, If any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, dot, 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 uh, in the New American Standard Bible, it says, if any man thinks he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, dot, dot, dot. Uh, the, the, today's New International Version says, if anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he is engaged to, dot, dot, dot. And the New English Bible says, if a man has a partner in celibacy and feels that he is not behaving properly towards her, dot, dot, dot. Um, all the same verse for somewhat different <coughs> versions of the same verse, which, if that was all that you had, might be in a particular way in terms of understanding what the verse meant. Thank Where you. is that verse? Yeah. Where does that come from? Uh, that verse comes, I believe. <coughs> I wondered why you chose this verse, but it's in that, that book, apparently. Yes, it's, it's right from the book. It's 1 Corinthians 7, 36. <coughs> um, now, the New King James Virgin, vir, virgin, yeah. <laughs> virgin uh, is, well, first of all, all four of these are correct. <laughs> 
It, they are correct translations. Uh, however, they suggest very different things. I mean, there's uh, certainly something different between uh, a general virgin, a virgin you're engaged to, or your virgin daughter. I mean, that, those are very different concepts. Uh, so, which is, is the most correct? Uh, the New King James Version is the most literal. It, it is a sort of word-for-word uh, -word literal translation of what uh, the original Greek says. Uh, however, the, and we'll, we'll be looking at why this is as we go along, but uh, the, today's New International Version, the third one, is actually <coughs> probably the closest to what uh, Paul was actually trying to convey. Uh, so, uh, really, the uh, today's New International Version is probably the best translation in terms of it actually conveying to us in English what was intended in the, in the Greek. So, we'll look at some of the ways that we figure that, that translators anyway, figure that out. It is likely none of us are going to actually be doing our own translation. We just want to have an idea of how translations work so that we know uh, what might be good translations and what might not be as helpful. Um, so, what do we do? Uh, well, generally speaking, uh, if you find a translation that you like, uh, it's, it is likely to be good much of the time, but not all of the time. And so, really, it might be good for study programming. We, we talked last week a little about two different types of reading. Uh, devotional reading, just spending some time reading uh, God's Word and, and sort of uh, meditating on it. And study, which is a little bit more in-depth. For study, you might want to have a couple of translations just so you can compare uh, whatever passage you're reading in a couple of different translations. Um, so, how do we choose? Um, well, there's two major things that uh, translators have to think about when they're doing translation. Uh, the first is uh, textual. Um, that is uh, the, trying to figure out what the actual original wording is. Uh, so they have to look at the text itself. And the second is linguistic. And that's um, sort of once you figure out what the actual original wording is, trying to figure out what the original wording is actually saying. Um, so first, what do you uh, as we look, as they look at the text, uh, you ha we have to understand that the Bible uh, doesn't, that there isn't one original manuscript of this book. Unlike our Declaration of Independence, that you might go into to the city of Philadelphia and see the original in, in the case, uh, and it's the original handwritten copy. That we, well, we don't have necessarily the, an original handwritten copy of the, this whole book. What we have are thousands of manuscripts uh, that were, have been copied over and over and over and over again. Uh, so, and many of those copies uh, are divergent. They're, they're not exactly the same. <clears throat> because if you think about it, you, they, didn't, they didn't have a printing press back then. They didn't have a copy machine. So you had uh, scribes who basically sat with the thing and were copying it by hand uh, over and over and over again. Because of that, there are some, uh, some errors entered in, and we can figure that out using a couple of different methods. Um, first of all, uh, they use what's called textual criticism. Um, so textual Criticism, uh, which is a science that uh, has fairly good controls, and basically 
you look at the both the external and the internal evidence. The external evidence would be those things, the quality and the age of, of the original manuscripts that you're using. Uh, so the, <clears throat> they know that there were certain uh, groups of scribes who were very meticulous and tended to do a much uh, more thorough and, and accurate job of copying than other groups of scribes. So those manuscripts are going to be uh, a little bit more reliable. Uh, generally speaking, uh, for the Old Testament, the Masoretic text uh, has been found to be very reliable, uh, and it's uh, very old, but it's been compared, uh, you probably heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were in Philadelphia not long ago, uh, and those are the oldest manuscripts that they have found. And the Masoretic text seems to uh, agree with the Dead Sea Scrolls um, fairly consistently. So uh, there's also a Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, which also uh, is thought to be very accurate. Um, and so those are probably the two major ones that they use uh, in translation. Uh, now interestingly, the New Testament, the oldest and, and most uh, accurate uh, manuscripts from those actually come from Egypt. Um, but that's so the external evidence is, is basically being able to, f to figure out and find the most accurate uh, and perhaps the oldest original manuscript to start with. Uh, and then there's internal evidence. Now the internal evidence has to do with what you find in the text. It has to do with uh, things that they, like common mistakes that they know that scribes used to make. For instance, um, you know, if, you, if you've ever been uh, now, we might be typing on the computer, but if you've ever typed a manuscript and you're done, you, <clears throat> your eye may drop down and you skip a line. And that's one of the things that often, and when they compare text, if, if uh, they see one and uh, it reads one way and then you read this one and there's, a, there's something missing in there, they can identify, oh, well, in this manuscript, it, you just, look, there's, there's the line and you skipped it. Uh, and went uh, ahead. So those are, uh, and there, there are a number of other. The other one is often leaving out a letter uh, if, you're, if you're writing a word uh, and they, they drop a letter or change a letter accidentally because in Hebrew <coughs> and Greek uh, the letters look a little different. Uh, but also by dropping a letter or changing a letter you can change an entire word. Uh, so that that makes it... Sounds like early texting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's right. If you get a text and you... <laughs> my, my wife likes to, uh, to voice text where you just speak it and it... But it doesn't always uh, interpret your speech. But so occasionally I get these texts and I have, to, I have to use textual appearances out of them. Okay, well, that doesn't make any sense. I wonder what she was trying to say. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's sort of what they're, they're doing here. Uh, so basically they can, one of the ways they can tell uh, that a manuscript is, is more original and, and, uh, and more accurate is if they can find the, the one manuscript that expl can <clears throat> explains the mistakes in, in all the others, that is probably the most original and, and the most accurate because you can read it and you can say, oh, I can see where, where, how they made that mistake, I can see how they made that mistake, and so that is probably your most accurate uh, translation. Um, however, uh, while it is a science, it's not an exact science, uh, because if you think about it, if, if uh, you're talking about, I mean, we talked last week that the Bible is both divine and human, uh, and if you Think about the fact that you have humans involved in the original writing, in the copying, and in the translating. It, uh, it, it leaves some room for error. Uh, but uh, by using the, the external and the internal evidence uh, in textual criticism, they, uh, we, we think we, there's a high probability that what we end up with is, is the accurate uh, <coughs> original. Um, 
So, you might notice in your translations that occasionally you'll be reading and there'll be a, a footnote in your thing. And you read down and it, it will give you, uh, you know, maybe translated or, or a, 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 another suggestion for what it might actually say. It might be a word or it might be a phrase. Usually what that means is in, that, that your translation was done by a committee. And like uh, the New International Version was done by a committee. Um, well, King James Version, the, uh, I believe the New Revised Standard Version, were all translated by a, a group. Uh, and when you have those footnotes, what that means is that they came to something that, they, that, that the group could not agree on. Uh, that there was that there was enough evidence on both sides that they just could not come to an agreement, so they would vote, and uh, the wh whatever translation got the majority vote ends up usually in the text, and the one that gets the minority vote usually ends up in the footnote. Uh, so that w when you come across those, that's usually what it means is that uh, that they they weren't really sure between those two translations. And so they voted, and the majority made it into the text, and the other uh, made it into the footnote. Um, now, uh, moving from the text to linguistics, or, or the language, uh, there's uh, some things to think about. Uh, this is, we're talking now about uh, the verbal, uh, grammatical uh, issues of the text. Uh, for instance, uh, well, and in, in talking about that, we have uh, we have to keep in mind the original language that uh, it was written in, either Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek, and then what they call the receptor language, which is the language that you're translating, translating it into, which for our purposes would be English. Um, and then there's your theory of translation, uh, and, that, and, and this is what that means. You have sort of a range. You have literal translation, uh, with, and So you have literal, uh, which means that you you translate the words uh, exactly and, and leave them pretty much in in the same order as the Hebrew, uh, and and you just it's a it's a very direct translation, and then you move from literal to what they call dynamic, and dynamic you you translate the words, but then you. You put them in a sentence order that makes more sense in the like, uh, for instance, uh, <clears throat> rather than saying, this is the Bible of me, we would say, this is my Bible. Uh, but if you've ever taken a foreign language, other languages have different syntax and different uh, ways of, of ordering their words. Uh, and so one dynamic, we'll, we'll put it into sort of normal, uh, English grammar, uh, and also they, they will make some choices about um, what, what's actually trying to be uh, conveyed, and we'll, we'll look at some of the, the problems as they come up. But for instance, uh, when the Bible talks about lamp, uh, now for us, lamp has a particular meaning. We usually think of something sitting on our uh, end table that you flick on and flick off. Uh, for them, a lamp was an oil lamp uh, that could be carried. And so do you translate that as lamp, or do you translate that as flashlight, or uh, lantern, or uh, something that, that would make more sense to us uh, today? Um, so those are some of the, the ideas. Uh, and then we move from dynamic what they call free, which you might also call paraphrase. The, like uh, the message is is certainly on this end of the spectrum, and that's where uh, you you kind of do <coughs> convey it completely in modern language and, and things. For instance, uh, if any of you are familiar, uh, and it you know it was probably thirty years ago, uh, they came out with the Cotton Patch Gospel, uh, which was uh, the, the New Testament written in, in Southern 
uh, slang, is it? And in that, they even go so far where they talk about uh, Rome, translating it, Washington, D.C. So, I mean, that is free. <laughs> that, that, that's just uh, basically taking this completely out of uh, the, the time that it was written and, and <coughs> making it very modern. Uh, so, really, most of your, your best translations are going to be in that middle dynamic range because they are um, they keep to the original text but try to word it in a way that is going to make the most sense uh, to the receptor to us in English. Um, so essentially a good translation ought to be sensitive and, and, and loyal to the original language. It should also uh, concentrate on the language it's being translated into, but if there is a if, if there's a difficulty, you really should err on the side of the language you're translating it into, because your whole purpose for translating is to help the people who are going to read it understand it. Uh, so you want to sort of tend to, to err on the side of, of that right. language. But some things that that are problem areas uh, for translating. <clears throat> and for making these sorts of decisions are things like um, weights and measures and money. Uh, how do you translate those? Uh, do, do you uh, leave them in uh, the original language, like uh, you might be reading along, and it talks about an ephah of flour, uh, or, um, or it talks uh, in terms of money about, you know, the, the woman who lost a talent, or the, uh, I mean, and do you do you leave those in and and put a footnote or an explanation as to what that is, uh, or do you try and translate it into modern uh, um, concepts? The problem is then, what do you do? I mean, if you're talking about weights, do you, do you translate it into pounds or do you translate it into grams? Uh, uh, and uh, who knows? If you're if you're talking about money, well, uh, if you have uh, an economic crisis or a, or a, uh, a depression or a, the, 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 the balance may change as to what that translates into in the modern day. And so you, you kind of have to be very uh, careful and somewhat creative uh, in, in how you translate those sorts of things. Another, another uh, difficult one is euphemisms. Uh, how do you translate a euphemism from, you know, Hebrew or Greek into English and also across centuries uh, and, and millennia and, and have it make sense to the people who are reading it? Uh, and one of, the, one of the interesting examples in the Old Testament is uh, when Jacob and Rachel leave her uncle Laban and head off and she steals his idols. She steals her uncle's idols and, and his, her uncle comes chasing after them and stops them and he's searching on it. She slips them into her saddle bag and <clears throat> she sits upon it and says she can't get up because she is in a woman's way. Um, well, now you, you have some options. Do you translate it literally uh, and have a lot of people who read it think, well, what, what does that mean? And, and be confused. Uh, do you translate it uh, directly into uh, the, the the current English version? And in some cases, I, I don't know today whether this uh, would necessarily offend or, but, but in in a way that you can read in church, for instance. Or do you try to translate it into a modern euphemism that means essentially the same thing? Well. Those are, those are the kind of choices that a, that a translator has to make uh, in, in uh, translating it into uh, another language. Good morning, ladies. Doug, is there a literal English translation available? Uh, actually, probably um, the King James is probably one of the be better. Uh, I mean, it, it tends to be fairly literal. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about King James. Um, 
to another one. That, well, actually, uh, probably one of the, uh, the one we use, the, the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, because really, the New Revised Standard Version uh, was translated basically to try and um, to capture some of the beauty of the English language that was reflected in the, the King James Version, but uh, do a, a little bit better job of, of translating. Now, the, what I mean by that is the New King James Version, or the King James Version, was uh, translated in 1611. Uh, in 1611, they did not have access to the range of manuscripts and, and things that they, they had a fairly limited uh, supply of original uh, language materials. Uh, and the ones that they had were not great quality. Uh, so as a result, the actual King James uh, Version is not the best translation only because it was translated from lesser manuscripts. However, it was a, a beautiful reflection of the language uh, of the time that it, it was written. Now the problem with the new King James Version is it tried to modernize the language and basically destroyed the beauty of the language and didn't improve the translation any. So it's it's really not very good, uh, but the New Revised Standard Version actually is, is um, close to the uh, King James Version. It, it's not quite as, as beautifully written as, as King James, but it's closer than most of the other, and yet also is a, is a, is a more literal uh, translation, and so that, I mean, it's a pretty good one if you're looking for uh, the, the more Literal translation. How could they? How how could that cabbage patch bunch? How could they change the whole location? Well, it, it was. Uh, well, I mean, it's kind of like. Have you ever seen Godspell? No. Because uh, I mean, it, it's kind of like that, and it, it it takes the stories and and just places them in in a modern setting. Uh, so it's. Uh, but I mean, it's 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 not marketed as a translation. It's it's marketed more as a, as a paraphrase, and a, uh, so it's so I mean, just uh, sort of take the issues that were brought up and the stories in, from the Bible, and then sort of plop them down in a more modern uh, American setting, uh, which I mean, I don't think it did particularly well. I mean, I think it was more of a novelty and, and a humorous kind of thing than uh, anything else. But and, and what is really, what is good about things like the Cabbage Patch Gospel, the, uh, the Message, um, uh, and others along that Phillips. line, is that they, they make us think, they, they kind of spark our imagination and, and make us think about uh, I mean, because often if if we read this, you know certain passages that we've read over and over and over again, uh, sometimes to to read it in something so different like that helps us to, to see it a little differently and, and get a, a different perspective on it. But they're not intended to be really translations so much as just uh, a way of sparking uh, some different thinking about things. But um, so we have. Uh, Where do you put Phillips in, in this? Yeah, yeah. Now, now Phillips really. Um, I mean, I I think his is, is more American English, but it it's 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 much more poetic than mm -hmm. than our. Than I understand his, he did it. He started it for his children because whatever translations he had. And, he and parts of it are really. Very nice. It's my uh, favorite translation. Yeah, it's, and it's always much longer. Yeah. Well, and that's the, and actually, it's funny because I have a I have a parallel Bible that has the message in the NIV, mm -hmm. and the message is always longer because mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he embellishes uh, quite a bit on things. And I think Phillips, uh, I don't think Phillips does it quite to the extent that he, he does. I mean, because he, he's he's very. Well, we'll finish up before choir starts. <clears throat> um.
So there's, there's euphemisms, then there's uh, vocabulary in, in terms of um, on either end of, of the, the translation. Uh, in, in the original language, some words can have a range of meanings. And which one is meant, and we talked a little bit last week about the fact you have to look at the word in the context of the sentence or in context of the paragraph or to, to figure out what, because it may have a range of meanings and uh, it's sort of interesting to, uh, you know, if you, if you look it up and what the original word was and what the definition of it, to, to see, uh, in some cases, all the, the range that they had to choose from and sometimes you wonder, okay, so how did they come up with that? But uh, it is, a, and that happens on the other end as well. Uh, you have uh, words that you translate in, in English have a range. And I used the example uh, in my sermon last week of the, the word love. Well, in Greek, for one thing, there are several words that mean love, uh, and but they mean different aspects of love. Uh, you have phileo, the brotherly love. The, like Philadelphia, you have eros, uh, romantic or sensual love. You have uh, agape, which is usually what the Bible uses, which is a more selfless uh, sort of love, and that's what First uh, Corinthians 13 uh, all describes there. Uh, but all of those words end up being translated in English as love, and and what? So you know, we may come to that word with all sorts of thoughts of what it means. Uh, and so sometimes it's, it's helpful to know what word they actually were translating uh, to kind of narrow down that, that scope of it. Uh, but it can happen the other way as well. That, um, you have a, a word that we translate, and it seems very clear, but then you look at the original word, and there's a whole big range of meaning, and then you go, oh, well, maybe it's not as clear as I thought it was. Um, but what we have to remember is the writer was very clear about what they were trying to convey when they wrote it. So there has to be a, an answer, and we can hopefully move toward that. Um, another thing which I think is often a shame, because it, it's just the hazards of translating, is uh, word plays. Uh, in the original, in any language, you know, the, you can do a little play on words, uh, which tends to be totally lost when you translate it to another language. Uh, and so it's, um, you know, you, and there's not a whole lot. Occasionally, uh, very creative uh, translators can come up with a, a sort of similar wordplay in English that kind of conveys with it, uh, and sometimes that works, but usually the wordplay is just lost in the uh, in translation. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, Hebrew often does is they will, they will sort of uh, link words that sound very similar but are different. Uh, and, but we lose that in translation because we translate to what the word means uh, in English. Uh, like in uh, Genesis 1 it says, uh, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was formless and void. Well, in the Hebrew, that is tohu babohu, which is just sort of a, a sort of sing-songy, uh, rhyming little thing, which is totally lost in, with uh, formless and void, or however we just, I mean, it, it just, it just kind of lose uh, the, something in, in translation. Now, it, does it affect what it means? No, not really, but it's just, you know, one of those little things, um, it would be like, um, now this is almost the opposite of uh, formless and void, but, um, you know, a term like spick and span in, in English. How on earth would you translate that into another language? And, I mean, I don't even know what spick is. <laughs> uh, and, and span, I'm not sure how that relates to things being tidy, but uh, it, it's... Uh, you know, there are just weird things like that that don't translate very well. Um, and then we talked about it a little bit uh, earlier, but um, grammar and syntax. Uh, 
every language has sort of a different way of uh, putting sentences together and, uh, and it comes out uh, a little different. So when you translate very literally and directly, you come up with, in English, uh, sentence orders. Uh, and so then the translator has to make a decision, okay, so do we, do we fix this and, and put it in proper syntax and grammar and, and all that? Or do we leave it and allow the, the reader to, to reorganize it, which, uh, quite frankly, um, I think, yeah, <laughs> especially these days, I'm not sure we do very well um, doing it ourselves. But um, so there are those issues. And then, and this really is a somewhat more modern issue, but issues of gender. Uh, because in the Bible, for the most part, uh, a lot of stuff is in the masculine. Uh, most references to God are in the masculine form, and uh, even uh, you know general references uh, speak about uh, the fate of man. Uh, well, you know, I, I think I think it's fairly obvious in some cases that it's speaking of mankind, uh, not just the male gender. But nowadays, people want that to be clarified. So, uh, and in some cases, you have to make grammatical choices. Uh, I mean, later uh, in the service, uh, Rusty's going to read from Psalm 1. And, I mean, that is written uh, basically as the man. And how do you translate that then? Uh, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates uh, day and night. So, in some translations you will get, Blessed are those uh, who do not walk in the... But, I mean, you have to really reformulate the whole thing in order to, to uh, make it non-gender specific. Well, that's because English has no neutral. Mm -hmm. no neutral. Right. It has male and female, but no mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and us ancient people grew up with the fact that he meant mm -hmm. everything. Right. It didn't bother us a bit. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm not sure why it started bothering us. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a... Mm -hmm. and, and to be honest, for the most part in Scripture, it, it doesn't bother me too much. It, it does sort of irritate me in, in hymns uh, when they rewrite them to take out any masculine. To, um, but um, now the, the other place that it gets a little ridiculous is we're, we're, um, going through the Presbyterian system to become ordained. You, at various times, you have to give your uh, a statement of faith. Well, it is this has become one of the major issues. Is that you you cannot use any uh, personal pronouns for God that are are so. What Jesus called his God Father. Uh, I <laughs> or was realize that, that I, I don't have. A, I mean, it irritates me. I but people get very picky and they and, and they will just grill you to if if you start using. So either people have started putting he she in which is just cumbersome and ridiculous, or they just, every time they refer to God, they say God, and, and which also just gets monotonous, and, uh, and I, um, and I have to pull it out. I actually figured out a way to get around the whole thing, uh, but <coughs> it is, uh, so, oh, I know what I did. I wrote my statement of faith as a prayer to God so I was saying you, uh, and and re removed all of the gender, because uh, it was uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, gender I issues are another thing that they do have to take into consideration as they're uh, translating, um, and all of this can I mean on, on the upside because we have scholars who are willing to do this. We don't have to, uh, but on, on the other end, we do want to find translations that are 
fairly accurate and, and, and fairly easy to understand, at least as much as possible. Um, now, um, in, in terms of study, the, the authors of this book make some suggestions, which I think are, are pretty good. Um, they recommend uh, that if, you're just, if you just have one Bible that you're going to uh, read from, the best probably is either the New International Version or today's New International Version, which is just an update of the, the New International Version, um, because that, that falls pretty solidly right in the center of, of the dynamic idea that um, translates uh, accurately, but translates it into understandable English. Um, also, they, they think, uh, along with that, that the New American Bible, which is, was translated by a group of Catholic scholars, is also a pretty good translation. And I was sort of surprised. They also like the Good News Bible. Um, so, go figure. Uh, so, one of those, I mean, they would, they would put the NIV at, at the top, but one of those three is a good sort of general uh, study Bible. Um, but then, as I mentioned at the beginning, they think for study, it's good to have a couple of different translations. And one of the keys there is to get translations that are, are not going to agree, so that you have some difference. I mean, if, if uh, they're pretty much all the same, then it really doesn't help you. <coughs> so on the, on the literal side, as I mentioned before, they would recommend the new Revised Standard Version, which is what we have in the use in, in the sanctuary. Um, and then sort of toward the, uh, the other end uh, would be the Revised English Bible and the New Jerusalem Bible are things that they uh, recommend. Uh, and as I, I mean, it's sad because a lot of people love it and it, it is beautiful, but they really don't recommend the King James or the New King James Version uh, because they're, uh, one, uh, that, as I said, they're translated from manuscripts that were not the most accurate manuscripts. They were all that was available in 1611. Um, the other thing is it, it's, a, it's really a lost language. I mean, it, it's written in the same language as Shakespeare, uh, which is, is beautiful, although you, you, well, I was an English major, so I learned to sort of get into to that, uh, for, but I mean, I had to sort of work myself into that mindset, and then you could read it, but it, it, and it does read beautifully, but it doesn't always help you to understand what God is actually saying, um, at least uh, for us today. So, I, um, so they don't really recommend this, but um, you know, using a couple of different translations. Then, if you're if you're reading something, you can look at it. And you can go. Now, the other thing that is helpful is, and I mentioned this last week, either a Bible dictionary or commentaries. Uh, in terms of when you come across something and, and your translations differ, and, and you're you're kind of wondering, well, how come this one translates it this way and this one translates it? That way, how did they come to those and say, well, your, your Bible dictionary or your commentary may be able to, to give you some information on um, what the, the word choices were and how they uh, chose that or, or what the commentator thinks might be a better translation. Because some commentators, you know, think they're the smartest person in the world. And, um, so they will often give their own translation of, of a particular passage or whatever, because they don't think anybody else knows what they're doing, and so they will give you something else. But they'll, they'll give you, I mean, we don't get all of the explanation usually in our translation. Um, and I, I mean, a good study Bible also has a lot of those, those notations right in the, in the Bible. Um, so those are um, basically the, the things that we need to think about. I was talking a little fast because I know we're have choir members coming up in here. I want to make sure that we got done. Uh, but are there any questions about uh, translation at this point? Uh, I mean, again, not so much that you guys are going to be doing any translation, but just so when you're looking at translations, you have some idea of what goes into 
to making them, uh, and I can actually print out. Um, there's a chart in here that that gives basically this uh, range, and then gives a, a number of the translations. Um, like we have uh, King James Version and New King James Version, the New American Standard Bible, the RSV, uh, and then the NIV, we're moving in towards here, uh, the New American Bible, the New Jerusalem Bible, uh, the, Good New, uh, the Good News Bible, um, and then over here, uh, this was the New American Bible, the New English Bible is down here, uh, and then the message is pretty much right on the edge. <coughs> um, yeah, Corey. I think that Bibles written in the vernacular do not have a tendency to generate much uh, reverence on the part of the reader if it's put in the vernacular. It doesn't have as much impact, if you know what I mean. Right, well, and that's um, one of the reasons it's, uh, maybe you might want to read something more in this range for uh, sort of your devotional reading, because it will it will give you more of that. Uh, but the other might help you to think about it in terms of understanding, yeah. uh, you know, the message, which is why you call it the message. Anyway. But, <laughs> um, <clears throat> any other thoughts or questions? Well, that that thing that you said you'll give us. It's kind of what I was going to ask you if you could do, give us like a list of Bibles that you would recommend because every year I take the uh, Daily Bread and I, this is my third year and it's my third version. So I'm looking for a new one. So could you give us a list of ones okay. that you... I think I'll, I'll probably redo it because it has all the, this chart has all the abbreviations. That might be more helpful to actually have the, the name so you can... Yeah, like this one is um, English Standard Version. Mm -hmm. Where's that one fall? Actually, I don't think that one's even on your there. It is still on It's a real one. Yeah. It's it a free mm, no. <laughs> Nope. Oh, yes it is. Yeah, it's actually pretty much right up here with the new Revised Standard Version. Does he have Phillips in there? Uh, no. You didn't need hmm. that one. That's odd. <laughs> that's a pretty tough one. Well, actually, I'm not sure that's as popular today as it, as it was. Uh, 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, actually, it seems to me somewhere in here they actually make a reference to it, but they didn't put it on the chart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that, I'm guessing, would be on this end yeah, of, the, of the range. All right, any other? Well, we ended up with a pretty decent amount of stuff. I'm sure who would show up this way. Well, let's end with a word of prayer, and then we can get off to all of our other colonial day activities. Lord, we do thank you for this beautiful day. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for uh, a day like this in which to worship you, uh, to uh, remember our past and look to our future. And Lord, we just pray that you would be present with us here today, uh, that you would uh, receive our worship 